Ghost. Michaela Bhattacharya is a well-known modern literary writer. She has won several awards and has explored different genres, poetry, stories, as well as script writing. And she has 37 books to her credit, which are uh, some of which are translated into English as well as Hindi. And she regularly writes for newspapers and magazines. They both are in conversation with Mr. Duba Hazarika, who is an award-winning writer who has uh, written over 100 short stories and essays. He is the author of three books of which two are novels. He is also a founder member of the prestigious Northeast Writers Forum. Please come. Uh, very good morning to everyone. And uh, I'm trying my best not to be nervous. Uh, it's very easy to write because you are alone in your room with a desk in a piece of paper, but when you have thinking pe people who can afford to, you know, question you, you get kind of butterflies in your tummy, which are not easily digestible nor removable. But then, uh, Mani Kuntala here, Anubhav and I, we come from uh, the, uh, the, the northeastern part of India, from a state called Assam, for those of you who may not be aware where this state is. Manikuntala, and I think very really inadequate for one more reason, which uh, Manikuntala having written 37 books, Anubhav having written 30 books, and I having written only 3 books. You can imagine the kind of infinity complex I'm going through. And nevertheless, um, in whatever little humor I can afford to uh, submit in front of you, uh, I just want to tell you that uh, uh, in Assam, which is a valley, uh, it's crossed by 129 rivers, which are two major rivers in the Brahmaputra and the Barak. We have uh, an ethos in the literary realm that goes back to almost, uh, I mean, it's hundreds of years, but the first novel was written about 120 years back. And right now, I will not say much as an introductory speech because uh, Anubhav is here, who is well qualified to speak on poetry. He's a bit of a cult figure, by the way. Anubhav, I'm, I'm, I'm praising you openly because generally I keep my uh, mouth shut about such things. But in the, in, in the realm of poetry, Anubhav has got his own status. Ali Kundala, with her short stories and her novels, she's also in, among the younger generation, she has her own. Uh, following. But the important thing is that the short story and poetry are doing far better than the novel uh, in Assam. In the North is because I happen to be a member of the North Writers Forum and it behoves upon me uh, since I know some of the languages and the literature that run extant in Tripura. Ashish is here who deals with Kokorok, will be reading out translations from Kokorok to English later. Kokorok is a language. Uh, we have the Meiji language. We have the Khasi writers of our society which does wonders, etc, etc. But today, uh, I would first uh, ask uh, Anubhav, uh, we hadn't planned out this, uh, please, uh, please, uh, we never had a prior sitting before, we, before this no session. Will get it. Sorry, sorry sir. No way we get it. Yeah, yeah, no, it's not that. Sometimes we pre-plan such sittings so that we don't fall into any false positions about, you know, wrong questions or the wrong inappropriate reply man. But Anubhav, I'd just like to ask you uh, first to offer to this very keen audience comprising both elderly citizens and the young from this beautiful place called Goa. Uh, your first foray, your first entrance into poetry and how you led uh, uh, a new thrust into modern Assamese as uh, poetry. Please. Thank you and very good morning to everyone. And uh, Dhruva already told that it is very difficult to answer questions. And uh, Professor Nil, I am teacher. I ask question. I hardly answer question. And that ego is in me, very much in me. I would like to ask question, but answering is a little bit difficult even for me. And now my jaw as it is poetry and 
answering question about poetry, it is even the first of all. Uh, and uh, he is asking me, how did I start? I, I belong to the central part of Assam and uh, in a village in a family of cultivators. I had my first education there and uh, I had my first lessons of poetry maybe in the way of life we do live in our villages. The songs we sing, the way cultivators relate themselves to their green fields. From these things, maybe I acquired my first evaluations of poetry. And I do not know how it became modern Assamese poetry or else it is very difficult to answer. I do not know whether I write romantic SMS poetry or modern or postmodern SMS poetry. But as I live in this space of time, therefore my language is of this world, of this people, of this land. And maybe, therefore, it is the poetry of this time. You said it so poetically. Um, but then, uh, you know, the word that uh, applies to the group that uh, uh, Anubhav belongs to uh, is basically a slightly natural oriented towards nature. And, uh, and there's a touch of sensuality to it. Nelip Kumar, Anubhav Kulosi, then Anubhav Basumatari, Horo uh, Faikya, these are the younger group and of which Anubhav is the senior most perhaps, am I correct? Yeah. Uh, Anubhav is slightly senior to them. But when I talk about sensuality, sensuality in almost all spheres of life, there is a slight experimentation too, which breaks away from the older mold that we had. And uh, uh, poetry is a passion. I think almost every house in Assam, uh, the 320, that 32 million people, even if you have one tenth of that, would probably have a poet in the house. Whether it's a budding poet or an accomplished poet, but there is poetry in every household in Assam. Uh, this poetry runs deep because of the abundance of nature. Like I said, 129 rivers, not to talk about the streams, the 625 different types of birds, the orchids, Kajirana, you name it, we have it. We also have violets. And because the antithesis of, I think, love and harmony is uh, violence, the evocation for poetry is that much more. But having said that, we'll come back to Anubhav again. Uh, we have Mani Kundala here with us today. Uh, Mani Kundala has uh, uh, been a very prolific writer. She's won, I don't know how many awards she's won. But awards themselves are basically only a technical term. She actually reaches out to the hearts of the readers. She writes uh, various columns in a number of Assamese dailies. She uh, brought out 37 books, including a book on, several books on poems, children's books, novels. So uh, I call her uh, younger sister that she is to me. Her husband is a justice in the High Court. I keep a slight distance just in case I rub off the wrong you know, word that would have to guess it. Uh, would you like to say, I mean, we know me asking you what you want to say. Okay. An introductory uh, few remarks, then I can get back to you again. It's not fair, Rubada. <laughs> uh, good morning to everybody. Uh, actually, I came to know last night that uh, Onubhota and I have, have to sit here for a conversation, and we have to ask questions to Rubada. <laughs> but uh, Rubada started to ask him us uh, about uh, started uh, with our conversation with poems uh, about uh, poetry. So I love to uh, 
Lido to one stanza of my poetry, uh, to Drohara. Yeah. <laughs> it's about you uh, as an author. You have made me reach, you author. You have made me reach and holding my hands, taught me to walk under water. You know how to swim, you know how to fly, how to talk, and you know how to remove the rocks. When you sit for rehearsal on a silken cloth, reach of my harmonium turn the stanzas. Music is in your pain, this is in your language. You have made me reach, you water, you have made me reach. Through Drupada, uh, I presented this uh, piece of poem for every author uh, sitting here and all around of us. And a very beautiful morning uh, in Goa, for the second time in Goa Literary Festival, and in here. Uh, first, I gave an interview with uh, a long interview. <laughs> and uh, today I am going to ask Drupada that uh, you tell something about poetry, but uh, why don't you try to write poem? Okay. <laughs> uh, I'm asking you, why you first writing uh, prose? Yeah, Moni, uh, yeah, this is a good conversation. Actually. Like I'm getting the, the words of it now. Uh, Prose, actually, I think, Moni, you agree with me, it's not something that you can calculate. It comes instinctively. I feel safer, more at home with prose and with fiction. Uh, I've been a liar all my life. Been lying to my parents, probably lying to my wife too. And therefore, fiction comes easy. I'm being a bit casual about it. But on a more serious note, uh, ever since childhood, where uh, in the locality where I grew up, uh, fiction was the forte. It was the kind of thing, uh, and that too, being educated in a convent uh, school where English is the medium, we were uh, given a wide uh, scope for reading uh, uh, basically fiction, fairy tales, and then onwards to more adult literature, and finally to the kind of literature that we read now. So prose came easily. It was an instinct. It was not calculated. I never thought I would be a writer. But at one point of time, somewhere around, uh, I think, 15 or 16 years, I was, uh, I was still in uh, school when I was maybe editor of the school magazine. I wrote a short story. And one or two persons said, this is not bad. So I thought, if I could get that kind of an appreciation from somebody, you know, at that age, let me try a second one. And it led on and on and on and on. And finally, I think, uh, uh, Poetry is given to only a minimal few in life, Moni. I have read some of the greatest poets as much as you all have, and some of the very mediocre poets, if at all poetry can allow that quality which is called mediocrity, because any poetry for me is sublime. And poetry is uh, the, the squeezing of the essence uh, from the overall uh, gamut of life into so many minimal lines that allow expansive thoughts is not given to all. It is like a, it's like a dancer or a, a physically fit man who sweats it out day in and day out for a very slim and trim figure without any fat. That, if at all, that is a metaphor or a parallel. Uh, that allows you. But the best that can be said about prose is that if you can write excellent prose, it is a touchstone to some kind of poetry. But to that extent, Moni, I have been uh, inadequate in writing poems, although I have got a bundle of poems with me yeah. which cannot, I think cannot be published. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, true. We belong to the same locality. Now we are living in the same place, Guwahati. Now, what Guwahati or how Guwahati is noticing you right now? Guwahati is noticing you as a writer. Uh, Anubhav, you know, for any fiction writer, the locale is very important. 
the Jokerzikian setting, whether it's a scientific setting, you know, futuristic setting, or a setting, uh, any setting cannot be, uh, I mean, any novel cannot be worked upon until, unless you have a very strong geographical setting. I will cite one Nobel Prize winner, uh, whose name is uh, William Faulkner. He is one of my favorites, that's why I'm citing him. And he used a geographical place, that's what you call the American South, about the Negroes, about, uh, about cannibalism among the uh, Red Indians, about incest, but he used a locale. Now, that is, that I'm talking about a very elevated writer, in, that is of the class of Faulkner or Hemingway or Perlis, but you name it, or our own Mahasrata Devi. So the local that writers like I, I grew up in a place called Shirong, uh, Anubhav, you know that that's uh, in Meghalaya. Uh, 30 years of my life, uh, school, college, education, everything there. And uh, the, local, the first book was on Shirong. Now, the second novel that I wrote was essentially about Assam. And uh, if by the word nourishment you want to say that whether I mean intellectually, you know there is this literary intellectual part of it, whether I be nourished in uh, Guwahati. Yes, I have got a lot of uh, wonderful uh, friends, uh, academic intellectuals, literary intellectuals, political intellectuals, people who think, pause, uh, who can debate, who know the meaning of uh, thesis, antithesis, and synthesis, people who can uh, who meet as often as we can in most of the literary clubs that we have in Guwahati. These have been a great source of nourishment uh, on the world. But uh, nourishment is different from inspiration. And I think uh, the nourishment apart, if the inspiration is to come at all, I think it can come from the whole of humanity and mankind, not necessarily from Guwahati alone. I want to ask you, uh, you already told us that uh, you have two novels, one of, uh, based on Guwahati and another is by Shilong. My first question is, why do you like? And second, uh, Nautilus, uh, everybody knows that Nautilus is uh, suffered in several, so many problems. It's which hunting problem, everything and the border problem also. Do you think uh, to touch the, this, uh, one of, uh, at least one type of problem you bring to your uh, next novel? Yeah. Uh, uh, the, uh, it was Somerset mom uh, who said that there is a story uh, around every corner in the road. We have every human being every moment there, there is a story at every single moment of your life. Uh, at the macro level, at the wider level in Assam, where there is there was violence, I don't think there is any more of the social violence that we have. We have violence in Manipur to a good extent. We have we have in Nagaland to a good extent, but not in the other. Am I right, Ashish? I think in Tripura where you come from that's gone. In Meghalaya, no. Mizoram is the embodiment of peace now. In Assam, we had the Ulfa who terrorized a whole generation. They wiped out growth mentally and every which way for a whole generation. Many intellectuals or so-called intellectuals thrived on that. They sometimes sat on fences and whenever the going was good, would side with the ultras and whenever it was bad, would go against them. They were faceless, characterless intellectuals who didn't know how to go about uh, contributing to society. For them, I need not spell out uh, to the children here. Uh, who, uh, I mean, a while back I was talking to one of the writer friend, a very well-known uh, author, author called Mitra Fogel. She is coming for the session at Kerber Club. She was telling me what what one means by character. Character is not something uh, you know. It's it, it's to do more with uh, uh, how harmful you can be to the to somebody else. When you say that I am characterless. You have to define by saying how characterless I can be. And one of the definitions is when I have no good feelings for others, when I wish harm, harm to others. In Assam, uh, I have written a book called Sons of Brahma. It was a metaphorical attempt 
at highlighting uh, a one person who wanted to do good to society and who had a twin brother from a different uh, a step brother from a, a step brother who was into the violent path he loved killing he was a psychotic who was trained to kill people and the other one was there to assist people so because the brahmaputra flows through assam and because the brahmaputra actually uh, swallows almost one third of Assam when it is in Spain, when it is flooding. And it's incredibly beneficial. If you go to Assam now, you would not want to come back easily. It's as beautiful as heaven. You have some of the most beautiful mustard fields. You have some of the best rice growing. You have people dancing. I am wearing this shirt for the first time because my wife told me, don't go with a typical shirt, go with an Assamese shirt. I just wore this man just to tell you that it's a colorful land. It's a beautiful land. So these two characters, uh, in symbolic of the Brahmaputra, which destroys and which at scientist, simultaneously creates, a book has been written. Only the third book that I'm planning is about a psych psychotic magistrate who has the power to kill people by ordering. So this one I will not speak on much because it's still there. I'm halfway through it. Maybe God really next time when I'm sitting with you, I'll be able to tell you. Dribble, how poetry uh, does inspire you to write fiction? Could you tell something about that? And second person, who have been in the bureaucracy, still you are there by <laughs> some way or other. How bureaucracy has affected your writing or your thinking or your ideology, etc.? We began by asking uh, Anubhav questions, and I, I'm getting it back now, good, you know. <laughs> but yes, sir. Uh, no, I'm feeling fine, sir. I'm feeling fine. I like this kind of an intercourse, primarily because, you know, sometimes without you knowing, uh, uh, unbidden, the thoughts come, and they, are, they happen to be genuine, because when you don't really think too much, it's more spontaneous. But to go back to Anubhav, um, how, how does poetry help in uh, creating fiction? I don't know, I think you cannot make a, you know, explicit, explicit dis distinction between reading poetry and contributing to prose, and reading prose and contributing to poetry, or reading both and contributing to both. The entire spectrum of reading contributes to your writing, whichever it may be. But one thing is very true, whenever I have read some of the greatest poets of Assam, some of the great Bengali poets, some of the uh, great English poets, some of the great French poets, and Russian, which is basically, again, more into fiction, but they happen to be some of my favorite writers. I feel, you know, that uh, poetry has a certain propulsion, a certain impulse, uh, in more in terms of imaginary metaphors and similes, which actually contribute a lot to uh, writing hopefully good prose. I can keep it at that without me getting too academic. The second question that you had asked, Honorable was about bureaucracy, a very sensitive part of the whole thing because bureaucracy is not a very, uh, very lovable term now in India, nor had it been for a pretty long time. It's rife with corruption, it's rife with uh, indecisiveness, it is replete with uh, arrogance, it is, it is, uh, bureaucracy is basically a uh, so-called meritorious, I'm using inverted commas here, uh, uh, so-called meritorious uh, uh, bracket, which actually carries no merit. Uh, it, it feeds, it's like a, it's, I'm not, uh, I'm not denigrating myself, there will be many bureaucrats here, or many young boys and girls who want to be in the bureaucracy. They can be excellent. Uh, bureaucrats and equally excellent bureaucracy. But then how does bureaucracy help me uh, into being a writer or whatever I have written? See, bureaucracy shows three sides of life in its extremity. The good, the bad, and the ugly. And I'm using the word extreme. As a magistrate in the fields, you come across criminals, you come across you know all sorts, uh, from financial scams to rapists to kidnappers, you have to interact with the police. You see the senior side of life where things are not rosy at all. And then you come across great nobility. You come across great grace. You see compassion, you see sacrifice. 
you see a mother uh, coming to you saying that I've got two children but I don't have the BPL card to help me get my, uh, my ration. Could you do something, sir? And then it's up to you whether you want to tell your assistant, please look after this lady, I have no time. Or you get up from your chair and over and say, uh, ma'am, please come with me. Uh, without any design, without any publicity, without any selfish motive, but out of sheer compassion, showing her how to get a car. You have a story there. Then you, you travel all over the place, you travel all over and you find arrogance. You find, uh, uh, you know, you interact with politicians, you interact with uh, uh, the uh, money controller's husband is a high court judge. You are often hauled up before the judge for a personal appearance. And sometimes you are you know, told to be on your place that you are exceeding your brief. So, Mr. Hazarik or whoever you are, please be careful from now on. Be where you are. So, it again commands you to get down to brass tacks, to be on your feet, to be earthy, like they say. So, Anubhav, I think the one thing I would like to be, to be, uh, if at all I were to, if I were to be, a, if I were to have a second life, I would love to be a bureaucrat at a lower scale so that I'm more with grassroots so that I can know the nerve centers and the pulsations of the, the what we use the word common people as as common people but believe me the word common actually is uh, is a very beautiful word it's an elevated word we sometimes we used to say you know oh, yeah, common cheese hai. this is a common place thing it's a banal thing but when but the word common is where life is it deals with life and it is from these that the material is gathered for fiction writing on work. Uh, in a busy uh, season, your daily routine, how, how do you write? Which time? Daily? Let us know. And uh, one question, you are a Assamese guy yeah. and uh, when you when is uh, feeling and uh, your food and your everything is in Assembly culture? You know, why do you like to think to write in English? Regarding the time factor, uh, I get up around 3.30 in the morning. 3.30, maybe 4 o'clock maximum. And then between 4 and 5, I do my usual, you know, take my bath, go for a walk. And from 5.30, I keep writing till around 8.30. Not every day, maybe four times a week, maybe three times a week. But in the evenings, at from 7 to 9, I write just before my dinner. And that's it, that's all. And, and about this other one, which is one of the most complex questions anybody can ever ask, that why being in India, where we have 480 to 420 languages, where we have 800 odd dialects. In the Northeast alone, we have 42 languages, man. So why is it that you are opting for a language which many people say is still a foreign language? I beg to differ. In this sense, you know, you have two languages in your life. One is your mother tongue and one is your first language. Your mother tongue is some, a tongue with which you tell your own mother, either you can tell your mother, I love you, or you can say, means I love you, ma. The, so long as the receptivity and the acceptability is there, it's fine. Now, as to why one writes in this kind of a language and how one correlates or has a rapport, uh, it's like this. Out of, let us say, uh, they say that 1% of India uh, speaks and reads English. We in uh, Assam, out of 32 crore, maybe 0.1 person reads and writes in English. When one writes in English, one doesn't really think about how many people one wants to reach. It's not for publicity or for the, uh, the vista of the readership that one writes. One writes simply because one wants to be satisfied person, number one. And then how do you correlate? How do you work out the nuances of the local uh, feelings, scales, thoughts into the English language. One of the major difficulties that a writer uh, of my uh, little uh, mediocre capability, if I can say so, uh, 
and one of the one of the difficulties faced is this: it's to do with metaphors and similes. Uh, when one has to compare, suppose I say today that you know, let's say Mani Kundala is looking as beautiful as the moon, or uh, Anubhav is looking as legal as a king. Everybody knows a king. Everybody knows the moon. But when you come to certain specifics, for example, you know, we have uh, uh, in Assam a uh, word called posola. Posola is the, the soft stem of a banana plantain. I think you have a local word for it here. Yeah? Uh, the the uh, uh, sir, we have a word here for that. So in, in Assam, we have that. Now, if I were to use a metaphor by writing the whole sentence, the grip on fiction will be lost. So I have to use that one word called posola and probably have an annotation in the back saying that this posola means this and this. And that is where some of the failing happens. But this is a failing which does not generally ruin the whole structure of the story. If you can, if you have the power, if you have the power of characterization, if you have the power of description, if you have the power of a good plot, then any fiction worth its name or worth its salt is worth reading. And metaphors, I generally depend upon metaphors, depend upon uh, similes, uh, primarily because it is a driving force. It is not as flat as uh, uh, some other story can be. And flatness, like, uh, uh, sir, if I may allow to use the word alcohol here, there are two kinds of alcohol for senior citizens like us. I'm, I'm a keto puller now, but once upon a time I used to take drinks. And sometimes they say, ye drink, ye bhoot flat hai. Ye drink, ah, bhoot taja hai. Means this drink is full of life, it's vibrant. And the other drink is flat, it doesn't taste, although it's expensive. Fiction can be like that. And if you have a good metaphor, if you have a good simile, it can be a taja drink. I want to know, um, do you love to read Assamese books? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes, uh, the greatness of the Assamese language actually we have had, uh, you know, we have a saint, Shankar Dev, Mahapurush Shankar Dev, who was an extraordinary genius, died when he was 120 years, and he is this patron saint of Assam. With him began the great, uh, during the Renaissance, that's, that was all over India, we had the same Renaissance in uh, Assam. <laughs> After that came, uh, we also had the Buranjis. Buranji is in translated English means history. And when the Ahoms first came about six, seven hundred years back, they chronicled each and almost every aspect of administrative and, uh, well, you know, normal daily life. And that became an accumulated tome. It became, there, there, there were tomes of these Buranji, which are there. But they were not necessarily stylistic. They were factual. And uh, good writing demands a good style. A very good style. But in later years, over the last 150 to 200 years, we have had, we have spawned beautiful poems, uh, beautiful uh, novels, beautiful literature. And uh, some of my, we have some wonderfully brilliant writers in the shape of Arupa Patankya Kolita, Rita Chaudhuri, these are novelists, Homen Burabhai. Bhaven Hoikya, these are legendary persons in Assam. Please understand this, because India is, you know, we have a plural structure. Mamuni Raisam Goswami, the Gyanpit Award winner, she is Pirender Kumar Patacharji. You name it, we have it. There is a whole list. We have great poets, too. I have mentioned a few already. And uh, we, uh, those who know the raw, the raw elementary uh, power of Assam, <coughs> Would, would know the raw elementary power of the literature that we, that we have. It's a very powerful language. It's a very powerfully evocative and occasionally sentimental. It is not a very cut and dry uh, language. It's a very emotionally charged uh, linguistic structure that we have, which gives rise to the literature uh, upon which most educated uh, ASMEs uh, feeds upon. Uh, a lot of translations have been done. Uh, by various organizations, and uh, in, I think in, in, in the coming few years, there will be more uh, uh, 
uh, more avenues for those who do not know ASMEs but know English uh, for them to know uh, ASMEs literature better. But Anubhav, I think uh, this question was basically first. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But maybe we'd like to take some questions from the audience. Uh, yeah, yeah, why not, ma'am? Yeah, sure, I think. The presence of Bengali is very strong in this sound, and I think there is this whole sort of, there's a power relationship between Bengali and Assamese, and also between Assamese and the other languages that are spoken in the region, right? Because there are more Assamese speakers than speakers of other languages, I would presume, which are limited one. So how do you deal with um, with finding a place amongst the languages that that is surrounded by? Huh, this has been a question that's that's been asked for the last I think uh, almost seventy years. That's a cliche. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you see, the the Assamese, uh, what the our language has been there uh, from where? I mean, in its proper from from the fourteenth century. What, what basically happened was this, that in the 1960s, uh, there was an attempt by the official powers to superimpose Bengali into the uh, official arena. This was basically at that point of time, we were very dependent upon Calcutta, both for our educational uh, uh, progress. Uh, most of the people who wanted to shine well in the academic life had gone to Calcutta or in the other. So the school syllabus was sought to be Bengalized, what we would say. You know, the script may be similar, but the, the other, the, the, the basically the words, the vocabulary, the Asmins have an equally powerful uh, input as much as the Bengali do. And in the Eastern Belt, the Bengali language does hold a sway. And Assam, because we are more taken and more Sanskritized than, let us say, uh, Mizoram with its Roman script, Meghalaya with its Roman script, Arunachal, which has no script at all, Nagaland, which opts for English, it's a state language, Mizoram state language in English, Meghalaya state language in English. So it, the, 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 the so-called tussle is between the, 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 uh, the Bengali middle class and the Assamese middle class. But the distinction is equally severe. All, see, the main question is not about the language part, but also about the literature part. The literature, if at all Bengali literature is so very well known and powerful, as means literature is equally powerful. And there is, uh, there is, and still is, a uh, feeling that there is a sort of a uh, Bengali uh, language tries to support impose into the uh, Asmi's language. Ashish was. Uh, Bengali, who is based in Tripura, writes in English, translates. He will acknowledge, if without asking him for any, you know, uh, uh, without asking him for any uh, mercy, that the distinction is very, very apparent and it's very, very wide now. Especially because the contribution of Asmi's literature in the last 120 years has been incredibly powerful. Which are the recent modern trends in Assamese poetry and which are the most important poets at present? It is very difficult uh, to answer both parts. Uh, the second part is more difficult to, to name few. Some top five, the top five that come to your mind in the interest of time. <laughs> uh, Samir Tati is there. Nalim Kumar is there. Should I place myself there? If you allow. Uh, then, then Jivan Nara. Lutfa Hanum Salim Abhyagam. From these names are from our generation. I am not naming the senior ones. You may know them. And uh, uh, she is uh, also there. Uh, Manikondala. I should include her also. But she is writing mainly things on poetry. Therefore, 
I, I, I am not including her within the top five because she is writing basically fiction and therefore she will be there in the top five fiction writers. And uh, better she should not uh, co uh, should not be there in both groups of writers. And uh, would you allow me? Eh? <laughs> uh, then what was your first part? There is a Poetry, uh, you drew out to all that. Nature is very much vibrant there. Yeah? Not only in Assam, but everywhere nature is vibrant. But uh, the turmoil in the society, uh, the crisis we are having in our society, and uh, the globalization that affected our society badly, uh, this is trying to create a new trend in poetry, which was not there in our seniors, they have not these things. And therefore, this is shaping, this, this crisis are shaping our poetry in a new way. And this is also common to uh, poetry of other Indian languages in Hindi or in English or other regional languages. This is a common. And there is another thing, ethnicity. Uh, there is a, uh, several ethnic groups and languages we have to take care of in Assam and they are also trying to put their own signature in poetry, Assamese poetry and that is therefore ethnicity is another, if you uh, can call it a trend can be, we can call it another trend and uh, there is not much Besides this. Thank you so much. Please. Instead of listening to us, please come to us. Mahoja Dada is here. He is being to us. Please come to us. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that invitation. Thank you for being here.